Because it just seems like people, I don't know, in our country, it just seems that we, we, we kind of return to a place where we remember the freedoms that we have, where we remember kind of the good things that bring us together. Uh, we just think about things differently. Everybody's flying a flag. My whole neighborhood is full of pennants. I got mine on my front porch. I'm super stoked about it. It's one of my, and this is weird, but as a kid, I always said I want to grow up and have a front porch that I could put a flag on and pennants on. I don't know. This, like, I knew I arrived as an adult. When that happened, that was a thing. Uh, I drove my kids out at 8 o'clock in the morning on Friday to go downtown to listen to um, the Tuscaloosa Bar Association, the, the DA's office, read the Declaration of Independence out loud. And they're like, what are we doing here? And I said, just listen, this is, this is important. And so then I had this whole conversation. Like, I just, I don't know, this is just a favorite time of year for me because it reminds us of some stuff, but it also kind of brings to bear some, some things that maybe we just ignore or maybe things we just kind of pretend don't exist uh, and I want to talk about some of those things today. First, we live uh, in the United States of America, right? And when I think about that, it's like the people who founded our country, I, I'm a fairly entrepreneurial guy. I like to make new things, but like I just can't imagine sitting down and going, let's make a country. Um, but our founding fathers did that. They just sit down, they sit at a table, and they, they, they wrote the Declaration of Independence, and then they put together our Constitution for the United States of America. And the problem is that lately it doesn't really feel like we're very united, does it? It feels like there's a lot of stuff that's that's um, kind of dividing us, so that, that we find ourselves kind of pushed further and further to the margins, pushed further and further to the edges. Uh, and I think there's a reason for that. I think it's because there's a lot of money that should be made the further we kind of get pushed to our corners. Um, suspicion is very profitable. It is. You guys know this. Fear, unfortunately, is very profitable. Uh, and again, division, therefore unfortunate but true, is also Profitable. There's a lot of money to be made to make us feel like we're more divided than we are. There's a lot of money to be made to kind of push us to our margins, to push us to our corners. And for some reason, we kind of fall for that rhetoric over and over and over again. And what I found in my, in, in, in kind of just in recent memory, is it feels like all of us are kind of put in a box. You either end up in a blue box or red box. Um, and no matter who you are, we want to find as quickly as possible which box you belong in so we can put you there. I don't know if this is me or not, but it's like driving me nuts. So I'm going to twist this one more time in case that it is me. It is not me. So whatever it is, that's on y'all. So uh, everybody look at the tech guys in the back and stare, right? That's what we do. Um, no, it feels like it eventually we end up kind of pushed into our red box or our blue box. And then here's the crazy thing. This happens in the church, too. Like we, we make a statement about something from Scripture. We make a statement about something like, oh, you're in the red box or oh, you're in the blue box. Like, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. That's not what I said at all. It, but it's, it's safer. It feels more comfortable to do that. Uh, it feels more, more comfortable to push each other into our boxes. You know what? Why don't we just turn this off and you hand me a microphone? This is going to be... This is gonna, uh, doesn't mean less excellence, by the way, so when we, uh, when we discuss this later. Um, so, wait for it. There we are. Everybody say thank you to Jamie for fixing the mess. <laughs> yeah. So, no, seriously, think about this. We do this. It's so much more comfortable when we go, I know you, and I can define you, and I know where you go, and so I'm just going to put you. But here's the question. This is what I wrestle with as a, as a Jesus follower in this country, as, as a person who loves our country so much. I wrestle with this problem all the time. Has division ever led to a solution? Has, has pushing ourselves to our margins or pushing ourselves way out to the edges or defining and putting ourselves in our boxes, has it ever led to a solution? And I think if it has, it's the exception to the rule, not the rule, right? The, the, again, it, it's, it's easy for us to go, okay, you belong way over there or you belong way over there and we put ourselves in these camps, but nothing really happens. Have you noticed that? Because unfortunately, and, and listen to what I'm saying for a minute, like solutions happen when people kind of move into the middle. Solutions happen when people go, okay, I have my firm beliefs over here, and I have my firm beliefs over here, but rather than ignoring that you exist, I'm going to have conversation with you because our community needs it, because our country needs it. And so these solutions happen when people go, like, I don't believe like you, and you don't believe like me, but our people have a problem, and we need to solve this together. See, here's, here's what, and this is, this is just a statement, okay? 
Why don't we despise division as much as we despise people who don't vote like us? I, I can't get this one. Um, and and I, I, I love our country. I love to vote. But like, it's fascinating to me that, that we despise people who don't vote like us, but not the division that it creates. Right? That we can have firm ideals and we can take a stand, but in so doing, actually move to a place of debate rather than isolation. Because I think isolation creates division. And, and here's the thing. Okay? We all know this. We all know this. Fear and division cause people to make a lot of money. Like, I think normal people, normal ones of us, don't really like this fact very much that like our country seems fairly divided, but there's a lot of people who do. There's a lot of people who are making a lot of money to, to talk about how divided they really, really are. Now, I know that this has created quite a bit of tension in you, and that's the point, okay? Uh, in the first five minutes of my message, I've already had you score in your seats, but that's the point, okay? Because I want to talk about something really important today that we can't talk about if we're not squirming or a little bit uncomfortable. So, I'm going to ask you to do something. It's going to make some of y'all really uncomfortable. I'm not asking you to do it for very long, okay? Here's what I want you to do. For just the next few minutes, if you could, just for a minute, take off your political filter. Don't, don't put it very far. I'm just going to sit it beside you because I want you to take it with you when you leave, okay? Don't leave it in your chair. I want to clean it up, right? But take it off just for a minute. Take your, take your, your Republican filter off, your Democrat filter off, your Fox News filter off, your Libertarian filter off, your CNN News, Newsmax, whatever. Just, just take it off and lay it to the side for just a second. And listen, because I think there might be something we can learn if we do, okay? So let's start with some common ground, okay? Everybody take a breath. We've done that. Don't, again, don't let it go too far because you can take it, put it back on, we leave, and go be whoever you want. But just, just think about something for just a minute. Let's start with some common ground. One of the things that we love about our country so much, one of the things we love about our country so much is our rights, our Bill of Rights. You know what this is? Our Bill of Rights is really the first ten amendments to our Constitution. It was put together by our founding fathers to respect and protect individual rights. And look, our founding fathers get a lot of grief these days. They built a country, and they were pretty smart. Some of the smartest men at their time were gathered together to try to figure out how to make this whole country thing work, right? And the honesty that they had about their work, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute, the honesty that they had about their work is pretty mind-boggling when you think about it the guys and the power that they were representing. So here's some of the things that are in our Bill of Rights. This is not like one through 10, okay? These are just the things that are represented. So you've got uh, freedom of speech, you got free press, freedom to assembly, right to bear arms, uh, due process, you can have a jury trial, uh, not to be overwhelmed with search and seizure, uh, you can't have cruel and unusual, unusual punishment, quartering of soldiers, which like doesn't apply much to any of us right now, but uh, no one is able to force soldiers to be quartered in your homes, right? This is a big deal when they wrote this. I gotta say, uh, at 5 a.m. when I was putting these slides together on Thursday, I kept staring at this word <laughs> because I was like, did I spell it right? And part of me wanted to put B-A-R-E, so like the right to bear arms, and then the other part of it was like bear arms, and neither one of those are really right, okay? This is what, this is all I got for humor today. We're going to need some, okay? So, um, here's what's interesting about this. Like, if we wrote our, you know, if we wrote our own Bill of Rights today, the things that we have rights for, we may make a little bit different list. And the Founding Fathers knew that. They wrote the Ninth Amendment, a little constitutional history for you. And the Ninth Amendment is a kitchen sink amendment. It basically says these rights can infringe on other rights that we know are inalienable and, and belonging to everyone. So if you were writing a new Bill of Rights, you might say, I want free Wi-Fi, <laughs> right? Uh, or, you know, I want free health care. Uh, or I want, you know, we would make a completely different list. So the guys do. They had this forethought. When they put our country together, that this is really pertinent to our time, but it might not be pertinent to all times. And so they put this list together. Now, the other thing that they said, and this is the tension that we want to talk about today, is that this isn't enough. And they knew this, okay? I'm going to tell you how they knew this in a minute. They said this isn't enough because they knew something that we have all come to know. Rights must be coupled with responsibility or things go terribly wrong, right? Rights must be coupled with responsibility or things go terribly wrong. John Adams, the second president of the United States of America, said, uh, he wrote this, and he talked about his own work. I want you to think about this. It, intricately involved in the creation of our Constitution, the, the founding of our country, and when they got done, like they've been in this room, you know, how, if you've got any history, knowledge at all, they spent all this time writing drafts and working and focusing and putting all this stuff together, and they walk out of the room and they're like, okay, Mr. Adams, what do you think? And he says, our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people, right? It was made for a moral and religious people. In other words, like, look, it's great, but there's a problem. What we wrote is awesome, but it's not enough. And they're like, well, what do you mean it's not enough? Well, here's the thing. It was written for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Mr. Adams, you're saying all this work he's been for months is inadequate? Yes, I am, unless it is for a moral and religious 
people. And here's, we know this. If, you, just, you know, if you've heard this before and you think this is going where you think it is, just hold on, okay? So just, just bear with me a second. They looked at all the work they did in the founding of what I think is the freest country in the world, and they said it's not going to be good enough if there's an ingredient that's missing. We know this today because here's the thing. When my rights infringe upon your rights, who's to say what's right? Like when, when, when my rights infringe upon your rights, who's to say who's right? Like we have to debate. Well, what we do is we create law, right? So if my rights are the way I and investigate the way that the freedom looks for me, and it's not the same as you, well, then we create a law to kind of close the loophole, right? Well, the problem is when, light, when rights collide, the law decides. So we write a law. And I say, okay, um, I don't like the way you're doing things. I'm not sure that's the right interpretation, so here's how I'm going to do it. So we create an extra law. Well, what happens is, absent this morality, absent this, this religious nature, as they said before, there's something that happens. You need more laws. And every time something goes wrong, you need another law, and you need another law, and more laws, and more laws, and close the loopholes, and close the loopholes, and close the loophole. Because law doesn't inspire anything, it just sets the minimum. Law reflects the minimum requirement, right? This is how low can I go and still get to go home? Like, how low can I go? I remember when I learned how to drive, and I looked at the, um, the driver's license test, and I realized, uh, there are police officers in the room, please forgive me for this, okay? But I look at it, and there's no requirement. Like, they said the speed limit's 55. But you don't get a ticket until 60, which means the speed limit is 59, right? Uh, and I remember thinking that, like, that's how low I can go before I control it, because that's what law does. It just reflects the minimum requirement. How low can I go without, you know, getting in trouble? So law doesn't inspire greatness or virtue or responsibility. It just reflects the minimum. And our founding fathers knew this. They knew that, like, we're just going to set the standard, okay? This is the lowest low minimum. And so what they came out with, with our Constitution that our country is founded on, which is fantastic, is this. Rights and laws. And here's how they define it. Rights, what we're entitled to. And law, what we're allowed to do. And when they got done, they pushed back from the table, having write, written documents that we study every year. And they go, if this is it, it's just not enough. It's not enough. It's inadequate. Remember what John Adams said. Here it is again. John Adams said, our Constitution was made only for a moral religious people who it is wholly inadequate to govern any other. And so, like, I'm going to steal his language for a second and put this up here. So if, if we're taking John Adams' thought, we need a third component. So we got rights, we got laws, and we got morality, what we ought to do. And you ask me why we're talking about this in church, because I want to talk about this. I want to talk just like right here for just a second, okay? Um, I think that when all we have is rights and laws, okay? When all we have is rights and laws, our national conscience begins to erode. Okay? Our national conscience begins to kind of disappear. And look, I'm not preaching a theocracy. We don't want a theocracy. Our, our, our religion is, is properly separated from government in the way that it should be. We're not talking about living in a theocracy. We're talking about having conscience. And I think that we should have a national conscience informed by the law of Christ. Now, if you're not a religious person, you're not a Jesus follower, hear me out because I want you to hear what this actually means. Okay? Can you imagine if all of us in the country, just for like three weeks, or a month, like, you know, a month maybe, decided that in the way in which we interacted with each other, we knew what our rights were, we knew what we were entitled to, but we, act, we decided to act with an ought. We decided to look at our, our relationship with other people and the way in which we talked to each other and go, you know what, I think I ought to do this. And the thing is, our founding fathers knew this. They knew that somewhere, somewhere, there was something that stood outside of the law, outside of their country, that stood above it with an ought. That there was some sort of moral conscience that existed outside of our country that lorded over our country that was kind of the king over the country. And they knew that if without that, then the freedoms that they had created and the things that they had described for us and the country that they wanted to have happen were their road. And they said, eventually, if all you've got is rights and laws, this thing will fall apart. So what might it look like to have a national conscience informed by the law of Christ. Well, I think it starts maybe here. Can you imagine this? Like, to honor one another the way God through Christ honored us. To look at another human being, and your first thought is not they belong in the red box or the blue box, but they are someone who God created, and they are of the same worth that I am. We may believe differently. We may look at the life differently. We may have different legacy. We may have different values. But they are someone that God created just like I am someone who God created, and therefore I will look at them with honor. As God looked at us with honor. See, the thing is, we miss this. Like, I miss this so often. 
Okay? Um, and let me just say this before we go any further. If, if this is the first time you've met me, or you don't know me really well, you may think you know, like I'm some sort of um, milk toast guy, uh, pretty like down the middle bland. But I assure you, I have very strong political feelings and very strong political opinions. And in fact, my wife's not here today, but if you asked her, um, you can say that she looks at me all the time and goes, Drew, do you really have to have an opinion about everything? And I'll, yeah, doesn't everybody have an opinion about everything? And she goes, no. No, they don't. I have very strong opinions about everything. I think that's actually kind of part of the problem sometimes. So let me explain. Because it removes my desire to honor someone who doesn't think like me. It places me between, it places something between me and them that removes my desire to honor them. And it's safer for me in my echo chamber. It's safer for me in a place where everybody thinks like me. But the truth is, not everybody thinks like me. And I'm not saying to sacrifice your values. I'm not saying to lay down your beliefs. Because like I said, I have very strong ones myself. What I'm saying is, what if we looked at this as an idea of honoring each other in conversation? To move towards each other for debate. Right? To move towards each other for conversation. What if it look like this? To care for one another the way God, through Christ, cared for us. I know I'm entitled not to care for you. I know I have the right not to care for you, but I'm therefore choosing to care for you because of what could happen and maybe what should happen. Here's a big one, to forgive. To forgive one another the way God, through Christ, forgave us. Forgiveness is huge, and we miss this. Like, this is so important. When we talk about forgiveness, parents, you understand this, okay? When we talk about forgiveness, <laughs> um, you know, with, with our kids, oftentimes it's kind of like, hey, you hurt your sister, say you're sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, right? Um, and then we expect, you know, they expect their sibling or the other person to go, okay, I forgive you. But, like, does anybody feel better about the relationship after that happened? Just curious, right? No, exactly. And so you know, then they get frustrated and it feels like this kind of, like, robotic thing that's happened. You no, know, to forgive one another the way God through Christ forgave you is to go, look, you hurt me. You caused pain. You damaged my character. You said things about me that aren't true. You thought things about me that aren't true. You've done something that's caused me pain. And I have every right in the world to hold it against you. But I am choosing not to. I am choosing. I am making a conscious choice to forgive you even though you don't deserve it. Because guess what? That's what God did for us. Yeah. Right? That's what God did for us. I mean, the, the, the thing is, Jesus said this, and they go, you got to be crazy, Jesus. Right? Uh, remember the law of Christ uh, is, is a term that I didn't actually grow up knowing. It's something that Paul defined in Galatians and 1 Corinthians. And it's this the basic idea that, that Jesus said... You're going to know who I am if you love one another as I have loved you, right? Um, the, the, the standard of behavior, like Moses was your guy, and now I'm your guy. The standard of behavior is now love one another as I have loved you. And so to think about it this way, to love one another the way Christ loved us, Christ went all the way to the cross. After he said these words, like, you're crazy, he, he put on the greatest display of love the world has ever seen. And he goes, look, Moses was your guy, now I'm your guy. And this is huge. This is massive. Can you imagine what would happen if this was the standard by which we approached relationships in politics and life? Right? Because here's something that, I, again, I, it feels hard to say. I'm going to say it out loud, and you're going to have to chew on it for a minute. But when we say things like, you know, every Republican is racist, or every Democrat is a socialist, have you talked to them all? Um, do you know that for certain? No, of course not. So why do we believe that? You know, I, I don't know... <laughs> I don't know what the right or wrong answer is in a lot of topics, but I do know I haven't talked to everyone. And so if I approach the table, not sacrificing my beliefs, not sacrificing my values, but decide that this person is of a sacred worth in God's eyes, and it's really, I am willing to have a conversation rather than go, you're absolutely wrong and you have no place in my life. I think that's actually closer to what Jesus would have done. It's actually closer to what Jesus would have done. Now, Paul talks about this a lot, and he talks... In a letter that he wrote to the Galatians um, that, that I think really just gets to the heart of this whole point of what's happening in our country right now and maybe what we as Jesus followers can do. Because I don't want to just point at a problem. Like, I, that's, that just disgusts me. If you go to church and you go sit and you're like, hey, this is a huge problem and there's nothing done about it and you don't get told what to do, then it's wasted your time and it's wasted my time. So I think it gets to the point of what we can do. He wrote this letter to the Galatians and they were Judean Christians and they were also Gentile Christians. So uh, people who grew up in Jewish faith and people who grew up uh, not in Christian or Jewish faith at all. And he writes a letter to them about how this new life and this new law in Christ was going to work because he knew that they were experiencing freedom. 
And what happened was he was afraid they as human beings were going to do what all of us do when restrictions are lifted, okay? Uh, when, when, when the law is kind of removed or the restrictions, the guardrails are taken back, we have a temptation to just kind of fill the vacuum, right? And Paul was afraid that as they stepped out of the law of Moses, like they hear this thing, like, you know, the law of Moses is so complex and there's so many things to do, and Jesus goes, I'm summing it all up in one thing. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love as I have loved you. That is the centerpiece of the New Testament law, New Testament ethic. And so Paul's like, I think you might be tempted to just kind of take that in rugs, and I want you to hear something. And he says it like this. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Yes, absolutely. But, like, oh no, not but. Why is there a but? Well, because this is important. But, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. In other words, don't use your freedom for yourself. Don't, don't leverage your freedom for the benefit of you. Leverage your freedom for the benefit of someone else. He goes, rather, serve one another. And this is, gets to the heart of, I think, what Jesus was saying. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Take the freedom that you've been given. Take the rights that you've been given. Recognize the freedom that you live in and decide. Look, I don't have to. I am choosing to serve humbly. I have every right in the world not to serve you. I have every right in the world not to love you. I have every right in the world not to care for you. However, I'm going to serve one another humbly in love. Paul said that's, that's what Jesus would do. In the center of this, even though you have new rights, and even though you have uh, uh, new responsibilities and, and all these things, they, this is great, it's awesome, but therefore don't leverage it for you. Leverage it for the benefit of someone else. See, Here's what I know about unity. You guys know this too, okay? Unity can't be mandated. It can't. I order you to be one. And then what do you want to do? Well, like, point out all the differences. It just, like, this is why there's not a, you know, there's not a bill of responsibility. Right? We have the, the bill of rights, but there's no bill of responsibility. Because you can't legislate that. Like, you know, I know what my rights are. Um, and you can't force people to, to give in to the oughts, to give in to this this thing is, again, um, that, that is speaking to us from outside of our Constitution, from outside of our rules and regulations. Unity can't be mandated. Unity has to be chosen. Unity has to be chosen. You have to choose to go, you know what? Um, I'm really comfortable here. Uh, I'm really comfortable here. Um, but I'm going to move, I'm not going to sacrifice my ideals, but I'm going to move uh, in, in this direction just a little bit because somebody has to go first. Somebody has to go first. What if you went first? In your family, in your office, in your business. And let me just warn you, here's what's going to happen. As soon as you move, like if you're comfortable in your corner, and you start moving a little bit towards the other person, not again sacrificing your beliefs, not, not sacrificing your ideals, but just moving towards conversation, here's what's going to happen. Immediately everybody around you is going to get disgusted, and they're going to get upset. What, what have you been reading? <laughs> you know, you've just been consumed by socialism, you've been consumed by capitalism. You, who have you been reading, who have you been listening to, right? And because it's not comfortable. It makes them uncomfortable. Somebody has to go first. And I think, as Jesus followers, it should be us. I think, and I'm, look, look, hear what I'm saying. I'm not talking just about Christians. Okay, Christians believe um, that Jesus rose from the dead. And I'm not about people who are trying to live this out in a daily life. They're like, you know what, I know what Jesus said. Uh, and I know that like seven days a week I'm a Jesus follower, not just on Sunday. And I'm trying to figure out how this applies to my life every day of the week. And so I'm making the decision to move in the direction of Jesus every day and every facet of my life. And so if that's you, then I think we should go first. I think we should move towards each other for conversation because it's in the middle. It's in that centerpiece of conversation where you sit on two sides of the table but you look each other in the eye. That's where real change happens. That's what pushes our country forward. And if, if nothing else, for the Jesus followers in the room, I want to give you a quote from Tony Evans. If you don't know who Tony Evans is, he had a really successful radio program. He was a seminary teacher uh, at, uh, Really brilliant theologian. One day he said, and I won't forget this, he said, Jesus didn't come to take sides, Jesus came to take over. Right? Um, and, and like, this is the kind of thing we clap at when we think about it in church, but when we think about it on Monday through Friday, it becomes harder. And we're Jesus followers. If you're a Jesus follower, he's your king. He's your Lord. And everything else is just kind of like secondary to that. And, and I hate to tell you this because you're, you're going to be shocked, but there are Jesus followers on both sides of the things that you're debating in your mind who don't love Jesus any less. They just don't see it the way you see it. And so engaging in conversation actually enacts change. And I think, like, you all know this, when there's not unity, when there's not conversation, everything slows down. 
all right? And our communities get stuck, uh, and our people get stuck, and, and, and our church gets stuck, and it's like it, nothing moves forward until there's conversation. I'm not saying it's not pastor ideal, but I'm not even saying change in mind. I'm just saying have a conversation. That is, I think, the direction that Jesus would move us in these things. And Paul continues. He, this, is, this is beautiful how he says this. The entire law, as complex it is, is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. We talked last week about this idea that, that uh, there's been much debate about who neighbor is. I think Jesus made that abundantly clear that it's all of us. And the interesting thing about this is if you think about the problems we face in our country, even the problems we face in our own community, the things that are going on with the people who we love, the people who don't look like us, who don't live where we do, all of these problems actually become really easy to solve the further away you get from them. In other words, the further you are from a problem, the simpler the solution looks. Like, it's really easy, it's really easy to talk about the easy, simple solution to something when you are far, far removed from it. When you sit at the table with someone who's in the middle of that problem, and they share where you are, you go, what? Oh. Oh. And I don't know that that, that oh means you've changed your mind, it just means you have a different perspective on what's actually happening. And I think this, this is a lost art, if I might say. I don't know, I'm just a pastor. Um, and you don't pay me for opinions, you pay me to tell you the truth, but I, my opinion is this is a lost art in our country right now. I don't know when it stopped. It could have just been like this for a really long time. But we just learned, we, 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 we forgot how to talk to each other. We just, we did. We forgot to talk about, we forgot how to talk to people who don't think like us. And if we can engage in the conversation again, not for the sake of saying I'm going to change their mind or their mind's going to change, but that I've engaged in conversation to see what might happen, I think some change might actually happen anyway. When Paul, Paul says there's a warning if you don't do this, he says, if you bite and devour each other, this is the 15th verse, if you bite and devour each other, watch out. This is kind of gross if you think about this. Paul's using some pretty gross language. Uh, just out of curiosity, when you think of people uh, who bite, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Children. Somebody said it right here, right? Kids. Kids bite other kids, right? Um, if you want to act like a baby, Paul says, and devour each other, watch out. You're both going to be destroyed. And you will destroy each other. Thank God I didn't have any kids that fit each other. But that's okay. Like some of you all might have, and that's, that's fine. But this is what Paul's warning is. And can I just say, does it kind of look like this might be going on in some respects? A little bit, maybe. So what do we do? Right? What are some things? The really simple, practical ideas based on everything I just said. Kind of sum this up and bring it to a close. Like this. Number one, do what's just, not what you can justify. Do what's just and not what you can justify. Think about that for a minute. Like, I'm going to decide, even though I have a right in the world to despise you, and I have a right in the world to disengage from you, I have decided that I'm going to move towards you for conversation. Do what's just, not what you can justify. Number two, do what's responsible, not what's permissible. This is, I, know, I have permission, I've decided, right? But, you know, there's something in me as Jesus follower that I've decided, like, look, I'm really comfortable in my edge, but I'm gonna I'm gonna to move towards you for conversation. Because you, you know, again, based on the law of Christ, you are someone who God loves, and you are someone who has a sacred worth, and I'm gonna move in that direction. And number three, uh, and again, stealing the language from our founding fathers, maybe we don't use it the same way that they do, but do what's moral, not what's model. Be the hero, not the villain in the story. How many times have y'all heard me say this? If you knew this might be your first, but write a story that you want to tell one day. With your life. Write a story. Write the story that you want to tell with your life. Do what's moral, not what's moral. There's a, a verse um, that I've kind of paraphrased for us to close with. And Paul said this to a different church who was basing some of the same things. Um, and the, the church at Philippi, who I've quoted multiple times and told stories about, uh, uh, was the first church planted in Phil in uh, Europe. And lots of things that were happening in, in, uh, in that church. But one of the things that was going on there that, that happened kind of in this was that they were completely confronted with different ideas, different perspectives. And the church was being lived out, lived out in Europe in a way that maybe hadn't happened closer to Jerusalem. And so he was trying to speak to them about how to, how to do that. He goes, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that we may become blameless and pure. And they're like, Paul, come on, you're in the pipe thing. What are you talking about? Blameless, pure, arguing and grumbling. Grumbling, this is what we do. Okay, this is standard. Said, Don't do that. They said, you will become children of God without fault. Children of God without fault. And it worked and crooked generation, right? In a, in a divided generation, right? 
uh, in a disunified generation. Children of God without fault are warped and crooked generation. If you do this in the midst of what's happening, he says, then we will shine among them like stars in the sky. I love that. Because he said, if we chose to follow Jesus, if we chose to live like Jesus in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of our freedom and permission not to, in the midst of, of, of differing opinions, in the midst of, of brokenness and, and fear and darkness, and all that stuff, if we did that, then we would stand out and shine like stars in the sky. Maybe I'm naive, but I wanted that. I wanted that. And I feel like if the church did that, if, if, if Jesus followers rose up and go, like, like, I don't think like you, and I didn't grow up where you did, and I'll do this completely differently, but like you're, you're a human being and, and of sacred worth, and I, I want to have a conversation with you. If we did that, like somebody's got to go first, I think it should be us. And I can't wait to see what happens. I, 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 I think you know what you need to do. I, I, I think we all know what maybe the charge might be. As we celebrate our country and all the great freedoms we have this weekend and all the awesome stuff we're going to do when we can talk about our rights, I just hope that maybe in the midst of that, all of us think about perhaps um, our responsibility in the middle of that too. And if we go live like Jesus, then I think it will be a great, amazing light in the shining the darkness that perhaps we see around our country right now. I want to pray for you as we close our service today. God, I want to thank you for these people who have come um, and um, been a part of what we're sharing today. God, I want to thank you for our country, for the United States of America. Uh, for the freedoms, the rights you've given us, and for all of us who have strong political opinions and we're, we're thinking about our filters and we're thinking about life the way we've looked at it before, as we leave this place and put our filters back on, God, would you just continue to guide us to live um, in the midst of our laws uh, and our rights, but also our responsibilities and our morality, that, that somehow, some way, that the law of Jesus could pervade um, what we do and how we interact with one another, because we think that, I think, God, that might be exactly what you've called us to do in the midst of of this season. Give us boldness and courage to live this life out. Help us to celebrate safely and have a really amazing weekend. God, we love you. We ask it all in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Thank you so much for coming to TKT. God bless you. Have a great weekend. All right? Take care. All right.